All right, we're here at Malibu Lagoon State Beach, the corner of PCH and Cross Creek Road, uh, site of a famous and historic surf break, a world famous popular tourist destination, and the site of a contentious but successful restoration project. All right, we're here at the sort of northeast corner of the Malibu Lagoon, looking out to the Pacific Ocean, to the south, and at the Santa Monica Mountains and Malibu Creek to the north. The lagoon is a shallow water estuary that, you know, captures water from Malibu Creek and everything that drains off the Santa Monica Mountains, filters it, discharges it into the Pacific Ocean. The Malibu Lagoon, and more specifically, the sort of western half of the Malibu Lagoon, have been, you know, continually degraded as a result of you know, human actions um, since the early 20th century, beginning with the construction of PCH um, that connects, you know, Los Angeles to Oxnard and Ventura to the north by a coast highway. Construction of the PCH, they would dump uh, fill and excess soil into the western half of the lagoon, uh, filling it, reducing habitat. Um, following that, the construction of Malibu Colony, this development of houses in between the lagoon and PCH, you know, further restricted the, the flow and circulation of the lagoon and watershed, and Know, reduce that sort of wetland habitat. Um, you know, in the, the years and decades preceding, the, the western half of the, of the lagoon would more be seen as an opportunity for, you know, sort of human development. There was um, a couple baseball fields installed, um, you know, on the, on the western portion. And these, this, reduction of wetland habitat that provides this you know filtration and carbon sequestration uh, really led to you know, decreased water quality increased contaminated soil and in uh, 1983 they undertook the first attempt at ecological restoration um, however their attempt which consisted of removal of the baseball fields and construction of uh, channels via, you know, access bridges across the lagoon led to increased sedimentation and decreased water circulation. So, so sedment would build up uh, as a result of the channels being uh, too narrow and also too many of them, um, and it would it would restrict the flow of water. Um, so the the consequences were decreased water quality as a result of you know, decreased dissolved oxygen and an increase in eutrophication conditions and anoxic conditions, um, as well as increased sediment buildup, which led to um, a loss in benthic invertebrates, which has major ecological consequences. So years following would see a battle to actually, to restore the, the lagoon. Um, in a more uh, ecological and biologically informed way. The scope of the project involved dredging the western half, the most contaminated, damaged part of the lagoon, um, removing and transplanting native species, and, and regrading the western half of the lagoon um, to increase circulation, as well as replanting thousands of California native wetland plants to uh, you know, increase habitat, boost uh, species richness and abundance, and sort of restore the ecological function, give the, the western part of the lagoon and the lagoon as a whole the, the sort of bones to, to function and repair itself over time. Um, north edge of the lagoon here, looking out across the western part of the lagoon to Malibu Colony. And we have one of our automated water quality stations. So when they um, proposed the, the restoration project, it was really important that they had um, 
pre-restoration data um, of you know water quality and species richness and abundance um, and other sort of you know ecological parameters uh, so that they could compare the development of the restoration project the data they were gathering um, against that pre-restoration data we're at the southwest corner now looking at some interpretive signage um, talking about you know, native wetland plants and sort of wetland topography um, this is uh, really important um, in the sort of fight to restore the lagoon um, that people had adequate information and access to information about um, sort of the restoration process one of the major opposing forces of the lagoon restoration project <clears throat> came from or at least was purported to come from a place of environmentalism um, people you know didn't see the need for restoration um, what they saw was you know a functioning ecosystem evidenced by you know living plants living birds living fish um, you know they didn't see the need to, to dredge it bulldoze it you know remove plants you know kill the inevitable you know number of of individuals that you would kill in the meantime with, with the bulldozing and dredging um to sort of you know rehabilitate this ecosystem um so having you know accessible information that could let people know especially in the early phases um following the restoration what they were looking at how this sort of barren you know regraded um mud flat um was actually uh, giving the lagoon the sort of tools it needed um, to, to heal itself. Uh, so we're here at the kind of southeast corner of the lagoon, um, taking a look at some of the physical changes of the lagoon and sort of how they accomplished that. Took some pretty massive engineering to make that happen. Um, so to separate the sort of wet part of the lagoon from the dry part of the lagoon, when construction started in 2013, they had to construct a temporary dike that was about 10 foot by 50, 10 foot tall by 50 feet wide across the lagoon here from the sort of northeast corner to the southeast corner. Another thing they had to do was they were dredging, pumping out all this contaminated, you know, water from the western part of the lagoon they needed a way to purify that water so that it could be safely you know reintroduced reintroduced or you know recharged back into uh, waterways back into the wet part of the lagoon or into the ocean so they had to install a temporary water treatment facility on this sort of southeast corner um, that could do that that could take the dirty water purify it and safely discharge it and the you know, monitoring and the uh, reports and analysis all suggest that it has been a success. Um, there's uh, success of water quality, automated um, you know, water quality monitoring stations suggest increased levels of dissolved oxygen, um, increased vertical um, circulation in the water column, less sedimentation buildup, um, and we have obviously the recolonization of the banks and islands with our California native wetland plants. Um, we have endangered species returning like the steelhead, um, as well as uh, migratory birds um, like the California least tern, uh, endangered shorebirds like the western snowy plover retained its function as sort of a, a way station for migratory birds um, you know as well as a, a home for our sort of permanent resident birds like our, our blue herons our egrets um, so just some examples of sort of the, the scale and 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 upfront engineering and construction to make it happen and the um, success of the restoration project. All right, now we're looking at uh, Surfrider Point here. Um, so kind of in tandem with the residential and development interests um, 
that, you know, you know for aesthetic reasons or sort of uh, ill-informed environmental reasons opposed the restoration project, surfers formed a really powerful, um, you know, sort of opposing force to the restoration project um, due to what they perceived as damage to the waves at Malibu. They feared the physical alterations to the lagoon as well as the alterations to the hydrology would irreparably damage uh, the sort of topography and bathymetry that make this wave so special. Um, so it could be a major kind of cultural and economic loss the damage to the waves of Malibu was cited by surfers as a reason why the restoration shouldn't happen. Fortunately, uh, you know, 10 years later, the waves are still great, still world class on a summer day, on a big south swell, or even on a marginal south swell, you will see hundreds of surfers here, um, hundreds of boards lining the world famous wall at Malibu. So the, the cultural and economic significance of the waves of Malibu were fortunately not diminished by the ecological, the successful ecological restoration of 2013. So the Malibu Lagoon and the restoration project of 2013 really provide a great example of the challenges of coastal resource management from the sort of contentious political atmosphere, you know, driven by the opposition of surfers, tourism interests, to development, residential interests, the kind of weaponization of misinformed or ill-informed um, environmentalism uh, to block this sort of restoration project. But it also shows and provides an example of you know, successful restoration and resource management <clears throat> of you know, sophisticated and driven agencies and specialists and the sort of work it takes to make something like this happen. The, you know, intense and meticulous surveying, continued monitoring, the engineering and construction, you know, feat to accomplish land management of this scale and the sort of engagement infrastructure the interpretive signage and these sort of engagement points to access the public and to, you know, sort of turn the tide of that contentious political atmosphere um, to sort of unite the various stakeholders around the sort of what is really the centerpiece of this whole issue. Um, you know, the health of the surf break the property values, the ecological function, all really start with you know, proper management of our coastal resources and ecosystems. And the Malibu Lagoon provides a great example of that.